Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, very happy to say we've got another phenomenal turnout for our webinars. Very happy to see that. I'm Mike Sadek. I'm the Managing Director of Retail Trading for Lightspeed. And we're very happy to have Mark Melnick with us today to do this webinar on scalping and on using ETFs as leading indicators for predicting the price movements of individual stocks. So Mark is not only an active trader, he's also the author of Scalping for a Living. Uh, he's a contributor to Shine's Room, which is an online trading room for active traders. I know the guys at Shine's Room, they share a lot of great information on a daily basis, so I definitely recommend that everyone checks it out. So that's shinesroom.com. And I think we actually have Dave Shine joining us today, so maybe we can get him to say a couple words. Uh, and if I know Dave, it might actually be more than a couple. So uh, please keep in mind that this webinar is for informational purposes only. So nothing we present today should be construed as investment advice or a recommendation by either Lightspeed or any of our presenters to buy, sell, or hold any specific securities. This is for informational purposes only. And like all our webinars, uh, we will be having a recording of this. It will be uploaded to our website. So if there's anything you, you miss or if you just need to cut off early, you can always come back at a later date um, and watch the recording. And you can find all our archived webinars along with this one at lightspeed.com forward slash webinar. And of course, we encourage you to ask questions as we go through the presentation. We want to try to keep this as interactive as possible. So if you see on your webinar console, there's a little question chat box. Whenever you get a question, just type it in there. We'll probably take a break halfway through and then again at the end to answer any questions that you might have. So that's it for me. Uh, Dave, anything you want to add before we hand the presentation over to Mark? Yeah, thank you uh, so much, Mike. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the seminar. As, uh, as we've heard already, is a, a really large, uh, nice audience out there, and I'm glad everybody actually took this chance out to get uh, really a sneak peek into, uh, for me, one of the most talented and uh, consistent traders that I've known over the past uh, 15 years. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, both Lightspeed and Mark Melnick uh, to uh, give the presentation for today. Um, you can catch... Uh, Mark and myself every day on uh, shinesroom.com at 8.55 a.m. And I, uh, you can, um, you know, enjoy this seminar going forward, and I think you guys are in for a real treat. And once again, I just want to thank all you guys for uh, making this happen today. So uh, without further ado, if it's okay, I'd like to pass the ball over to Mr. Mark Milnick, and uh, you can take it from here and uh, just save your questions, I guess, or throughout, or uh, type them in. So uh, go ahead, Mark, whenever you're ready. Thanks, Dave. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Kind of an interesting day if you're watching the market today. Uh, we were dipping, we were pulling, we were dipping, we were pulling. So the real question is, what are some professional traders doing out there to capitalize on some of these certain movements, these movements throughout the day? How do you capitalize on them? How do you predict them? And um, this, uh, this is the first chapter of my book that I'm going to talk about right here. It's uh, Predict Your Stock's Next Move. Um, and uh, I'm just going to sort of jump into it. I, if you do have any questions, please have a pen and paper out. Please just type it up into the screen, remember it, whatever you'd like to do, as I'll be taking a set of questions uh, halfway through the seminar and then uh, at the very end. So uh, I am going to go ahead and proceed. And I'm going to start out with a quote. It's the first quote of my book, and it's uh, Orpheus Descending, which was a Broadway play back in 1957 by Tennessee Williams. And the quote is uh, this, the future is called perhaps, which is the only possible thing to call the future. And the only important thing is not to allow that to scare you. Now what I really got this quote, what really inspired me about this quote is the fact that no matter who you are, you could be Warren Buffett, you could be George Soros, you could be anybody in this world, and you know what? You will be right and wrong when you trade in the market. However, if you can have a higher percentage chance of being able to catch some of these moves in the market with a good risk-reward value basis and able to read it beforehand, you are setting yourself up in my humble opinion, to become a better trader. So 
I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to just jump into the front here and I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a few things here. I'm going to start off with a major index ETF. What is a major index ETF? A major index ETF is uh, an ETF that is liquid enough to attract institutions and highly correlated to the sector or industry it describes. An example that I'm sure a lot of you already know of. The Spiders S&P 500 ETF, the SPIES, SPY, trades millions of shares daily and has a beta of 0.99, indicating that it is very closely correlated to the S&P 500. So throughout this seminar, I'm going to be showing you guys, or hopefully giving you an insight into how I utilize these major index ETFs to take advantage of our stocks movements. Then I'm going to talk about the ability to identify chart correlations when overlapping charts above each other using those chart correlations to literally, in my humble opinion again, predict your stock's next move with a very high percentage. This will allow us to take advantage of high probability plays and throughout this inside my book, I am actually, I've been trading on Lightspeed for a very long time. And um, I've been seeing other softwares. I have hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, trader friends out there. And I will tell you, inside my book, there's a whole section dedicated to how to use the Lightspeed software, utilized through my humble opinion, through my eyes, and what I do to uh, be able to trade as effectively as possible. So I do talk about in my book minimizing your risk by setting those tight stops at very fast speeds using the Lightspeed software and, and I'll go a little uh, potentially into that later if I do have time. So what is an ETF? What is an ETF? Well, the ETF right here, the spiders and the cues, which I like to follow the cues, is something that I use what I call the force. I call these ETFs the force. The force is the ability to predict the future movements of your stock based off the ETF you are watching. Once I am able to find the chart correlation between the ETF I'm watching and the stock that I wish to trade, I can read the future movements of a stock the majority of times for this ETF. Very important, this ETF will move before the stock does almost all the time for the majority of stocks. You'll have certain leaders, especially Apple, which I'll get into, that sometimes lead the ETF, especially over the past three and a half months, but over a larger period of one year, two year, 20 years, the ETF usually moves slightly before or way before certain stocks depending on their beta. So these major index ETFs, you know what it is? It's like if you guys ever played with Play-Doh. And, you know, you didn't get all the colors from Play-Doh. But what this ETF is, is you took the yellow Play-Doh and the green Play-Doh, and you kept mushing it together until you got blue Play-Doh. And that's sort of what an ETF is. It sort of mixes in a bunch of stocks together, meshes them up, and that is the basket of stocks you're trading. And the power of this is it's extremely correlated to the markets and to more things that you may be aware of. I'm showing right now the 10 top holdings of our triple Qs. And I'll talk a little bit in about a moment why I use the triple Qs over the spiders. And hopefully you'll realize um, it's really just a matter of preference. The relevancy is uh, pretty low. So we're looking at Apple now. We know that the Qs are consisted of 13.84% of Apple being its largest holdings. Then you see Microsoft, Oracle, Google, Intel just going down the list as the holdings decrease. The NASDAQ 100 consists of 100 stocks. These are the top 10 holdings of their stocks. So right here, I'm pulling up a one-year chart of the Qs. You can see on your left side here, you have your May 6 flash crash. And then we grind it up higher, obviously, since then, before this big downturn recently. And then we bounced up, sort of looked like a bear flag pattern, and then it started trying to break up higher. Really interesting market here. But 
was there any way we could have taken advantage of this? Now, of course, you could be like, this one stock moved on that day. I was watching Ameren on this day. I was watching Ralcorp today. Was there anything that we could have consistently made money in? So before I get into that, I'm going to look at the Qs versus the spiders. And whether you decide to trade off the Qs or the spiders or whatever you use to use to correlate your ETF with your stock, you can easily see that the correlation between these two ETFs is close to 100%. It's closer to 99.9. You will see those rare days where um, they weren't perfectly correlated. But looking at the chart overlap, the chart correlation is readily apparent. So I love Apple. For those who... <laughs> For those of you who've uh, followed me and listened to me, I love trading Apple. So, obviously, what should I be looking at if I wanted to trade Apple? I wake up in the morning, I get up, I brush my teeth, I have my coffee, I uh, read the paper, and I sit down you know, at my desk, and I'm thinking to myself, what do I want to trade? I want to trade Apple. So what should I be looking for if I wanted to trade Apple? The easiest way to trade market leaders such as Apple is to look for an ETF that actually includes holdings of Apple. In this case, obviously, as previously shown, the Qs. So if I were to trade Apple, I would closely track these movement of the Qs for the Qs would serve as an indicator for me of Apple's future movements, often giving me ample opportunity to react by buying or selling Apple as a result of the Qs moving up or down, respectively. And let's say you don't like to trade Apple. The Qs is the NASDAQ 100. How does this correlation affect it? You were looking at a chart right now, a daily chart of the Qs overlapped with MCP. Even a rare element miner, such as Molycorp, which is not even on the NASDAQ. NASDAQ names have four or five letters in them. MCP is a Dow Jones name on the New York Stock Exchange. So, however, since the Qs overlap with the spies, and we see the chart correlation there, so that means you can probably look at a chart correlation between the Qs, the spiders, Apple, and Molycorp. But for this example, we are using the Qs, and I just want to show you how you can use these index ETFs to trade Molycorp. I mean, do you see a chart correlation here? Okay, not 100% of the time, but for the majority of the time, it's quite apparent that if I wanted to trade Molycorp, that there is no way I wouldn't have the cues up, watching them closely, looking for potential breakouts to, to take advantage of Molycorp's movements. I don't even want to trade the cues. I sometimes do, very rarely. If I want to trade Molycorp, those... The, the level two of the cues is going to be glued to my eyes. I'm going to be glued to the chart. I'm going to be watching for potential breakouts, and I'm going to show you shortly how you can utilize that. Cirrus Logic, cloud computing company. Do you see a chart correlation between Cirrus Logic and the cues? And please keep in mind, I'm just using a one-year example over here. This is another daily chart of the cues overlap with Cirrus Logic. I'm just using it an example here We're using the one year time frame if you wanted to go back 10 years most of the time you will see that correlation now granted there might be points in time where Cirrus logic while the cues were going down were dipping heavier and maybe they were going up more when the cues were grinding up but the chart correlation is there so before I move on, because uh, I'm going to get into just a little bit about uh, reading the breakout into some of these chart patterns, I just wanted to know if anybody had uh, any questions. So, uh, no questions so far, Mark, so I think we can uh, keep going. Okay, awesome. Now I'm showing an example of the Qs over AK Steel. Can you trade AK Steel off the Qs? Do you see a chart correlation between these two 
uh, two charts. I denote the Qs by green and red bars up and down, and AK Steel by yellow and blue bars up and down. Is there a chart correlation here? So the point I'm trying to make through these charts is that you can trade anything that you want because the stocks in these ETFs give you a broad view of the market as a whole despite the lack of obvious correlations. How many times have you seen Apple down 10 or more points when the Dow was up 200? It happens rarely, if ever, short of a few days that you could have thought of some news, for market leaders pull up or drag down other companies of the same sector, even if those other companies don't trade on the same exchange. They will drag them up and down alongside with them. And since we're able to understand that market leaders can often drag the market with them, one can also assume that a movement in the queues, in this current example, will result in a directional movement for many stocks on the market, even if they are not part of the queues holdings whatsoever. Here's a chart overlapped of the queues over Ford, automaker Ford. Stock like Ford. Sometimes a trader like me likes to add liquidity. It's a very big deal because Ford is in a very tight spread. By using the light speed layout, I'm able to take advantage of things like Ford by trying to add liquidity with the speed and the tools that it gives me. And when I'm talking about light speed, I just want you to know, um, I got a call. I'm not going to say my friend's name right now on the air, but you know what? I will say there's a guy who called me on that flash crash day on May 6th and another guy, and I was getting phone calls all day on the flash crash day. And you know what? Every single one of my friends had their platforms crash on them on that day <laughs> while I was able to stay connected to my Lightspeed platform and call Apple on a live broadcast at its low. When it broke under 200 and hit the mid-199s, I was buying Apple on the offer while these other people were on the phones trying to access their brokerage houses, trying to find out, hey, what happened to my account? Oh, we're getting a lot of calls. Please hold. That was just one thing that uh, really bailed me out. I was really appreciative for that. Uh, now th I'm looking at Mark, th Mark th thanks for that plug. Uh, we actually had a, a pretty relevant question that just came in, so I wanted to interrupt you for a second to read it out. Um, so on all these slides, you're showing us comparing these different stocks to the queues. Uh, and the question is, you know, if you're trading nicely listed stocks versus NASDAQ, uh, are you still following the queues, or should you be following uh, an ETF that represents more of the nicely listed stocks? It doesn't matter. Well, thanks for that question, and uh, that's just uh, one of the points I was trying to make here, that the since, I mean, you're saying, why not follow the spiders? Why the cues? Again, it's a matter of personal preference. The cues and the spiders will have the strongest correlation of any of these charts that I'm showing you, so at any time, uh, you can use, I, I will personally follow the cues if you're asking me what I would do. However, it's A-OK -okay if you prefer the spiders. Okay, great. And I know that you're primarily an equities trader, but could this same theory be used to uh, for futures traders who are trading the E-minis, or would you equate the E-minis more to the ETF itself? Um, both. Since the Qs do correlate with the E-minis, if you did want to trade the E-minis, a uh, technical pattern is a technical pattern. And when you see the breakout coming out of that pattern, you could apply it on a longer-term chart. This daily chart you're looking at will confirm correlation or should confirm correlation if you do want to use this technique to be applied to your trading. You can look at a weekly chart, a monthly chart, a yearly chart, or a daily chart, or a one-minute chart, or a 10-second chart. So trading the E-minis, doing futures trading, usually, um, not always, but usually uh, in terms of holding the position a lot longer than, for example, a hyper scalper, you would be able to apply that same strategy to trading the futures. Great, thanks. Okay, um, if that's all the questions, I'm going to continue. Go on. 
So sometimes people ask me about certain metal companies and metal stocks and, you know, how do the cues relate to metals? I, uh, for those who know me and have followed me for a while, thank you. And uh, you do know that Mark Melnick is not a big fan of uh, scalping in silver and gold. Um, however, there is a correlation between, I, do, I will trade FCX before an SLV more often than not or a GLD more often than not. Uh, and the reason is this. This is why. Some people have asked me, why will you trade FCX? Because it's a big copper and gold miner. Um, obviously, you know, C and uh, steel as well, FCX. So, you know, why would I trade uh, FCX? This is the reason, people, why I would trade an FCX instead of the others. Because of this chart correlation. Because this chart correlates better, uh, the Q's chart correlate better with an FCX right now as opposed to a GLD, as opposed to an SLV, the silver and uh, gold ETFs. But you know what? Looking at the Qs here, look at this chart correlation. You know how many of these days where FCX correlated with uh, the Qs? It was very easy to take advantage of an FCX. You will see a couple divergence days. Don't get me wrong. There are there are small divergence. However, the correlation is still over 90% effective on a chart like this of Qs and FCX. So even if I wanted to trade an FCX, I would be looking at the Qs for this very reason. And moving on, I'm going to take a look at uh, Lowe's Corporation letter L. And I'm, and again, I'm just plugging in random stocks. I this webinar is not uh, three weeks long. Otherwise, I would show you, you know, the 5,000 plus stocks that I could name off the top of my head to show you this correlation. But taking a look even at a stock like Lowe's here, you could just see how the cues allow you to potentially take advantage of uh, Lowe's. So if I wanted to trade a company like Lowe's, you can easily use the cues. As a result, you can easily use the spiders. As a result, for that person asking the futures question, you can easily use the e-minis. So those are just things that you could potentially do to read lows, and that's the part of it that you must understand that there is a chart correlation between the two. So I do want to talk about just a little bit about chart correlation. I'm not going to, going to get into uh, a, a large lesson right now on candlestick breakouts. Uh, you could read my book if you want to see that. Uh, but looking right here on the cues, I just drew a line there, and you could just see the cues breaking out of a five-minute range after it just sort of viewed off and, uh, on a small pattern there and started grinding up. So you can easily see the cues breaking out of a five-minute range. So what I do is, before you see the cues, that green bar, it looks like a hammer bar right where I have that second red dot. But you know what? Just looking at the cues here, when it actually breaks up, you know, and you could see that coming, I use this to my advantage. So what I would do is I could potentially be looking at a stock at Apple as the cues are approaching this potential breakout level and buy Apple because if the cues indeed do break out of this five minute level, more often than not, I will be able to capitalize on Apple. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to overlap a chart of uh, the five minute chart of Apple uh, over the five minute chart of the cues here. And I just want you to see what it looks like when we're talking about chart correlation. This was uh, this chart was actually taken yesterday. I didn't, you know, have something saved up to make up this chart correlation to you to show you this. This is what Apple overlapped with the Qs will look like on a pretty consistent basis. So we do see, you do see the yellow bars, the up bars in Apple, the blue bars, the down bars in Apple, and you do see those yellow bars breaking up with the cues there. And uh, I don't know if you realize because the right side of the screen shows obviously the cues level with Apple being, you know, obviously over a $300 stock. That move on, a, and this is a five minute chart, we're talking Apple moved on that breakout, we're talking eight points. Eight points it moved on that breakout within an hour. So keep in mind that you do have those very large movements that you're able to capitalize if you're able to technically break down the cues, see where those cues are breaking out to the upside, breaking down to the downside, and take advantage of a stock that has a chart correlation with it and play it accordingly to your own risk parameters. Uh, that would uh, conclude this for now, but I will be taking uh, questions if anybody uh, has any comments, I'm sure uh, Mike will take over. Sure, so let's just see if uh, any additional questions come in.
So uh, we, we're getting a couple of questions related to kind of the same topic. So why are you trading stocks like Apple against the Qs instead of just trading the Qs? The beauty behind it is uh, the ability to take multiple uh, multiple size positions against the queues and actually get a further movement. So, for example, um, Apple is uh, whatever. Let's just call it, for numbers' sake, let's just call it uh, a four hundred dollar stock. And let's just for numbers' sakes, I know the queues are high, but let's just call the queues fifty a fifty dollar ETF. So, if you were to take you know eight hundred shares of the queues, and I took a hundred shares of Apple, and the queues ramped up, let's say seven or eight cents, I've seen Apple on a ramp up of the queues of seven, eight cents shoot up a dollar. So catching eight cents, for example, on 800 shares, you know, everything else excluded would be 64 bucks. And if I were to catch 100 shares of Apple and catch a point on that based on a queues move like that, not only would I, from personally for me, to get out of 100 shares is a lot easier to get out of 800 shares, and that's just a numbers example to show you the correlation. I would be able to catch more money off of Apple than I would with an identically, uh, an identical money position in the queues. Okay, great. And is this strategy applicable to intraday scalping, or can you also use this for longer-term swing trades? I use it for everything. Technical levels, again, are technical levels, and when you're looking for a breakout, it could be a breakout on a monthly, it could be a breakout on a weekly, and it could be a breakout on a five-minute chart. The same technical uh, patterns apply uh, given the, you know, the amount of time you're planning on holding the position. Obviously, if I wanted to hold the position for a month, I wouldn't be looking at a five-minute chart. I'd, I might be looking at a daily or weekly, and if I wanted to hold the stock for five seconds with, you know, Lightspeed gives me the ability to do that, uh, five seconds or five minutes, I will be able to use a shorter time frame chart to try to read those uh, smaller moves. The microscope would just get, uh, would tune in just a little more there. Okay, great. Um, and you also mentioned that the cues foreshadow some other slower moving stocks. Uh, do you have any examples? Absolutely. Um, slower moving stocks than Apple is uh, just about all of them. Maybe you want to put Google on the same level, but uh, Qualcomm is intermediately fast. Cirrus Logic is probably right in the middle with Cisco probably underneath there somewhere. Not as of recently, but more often than not, Microsoft is underneath some there. Just stocks that tend to have a very tight range or relatively tight range comparatively to a stock like Apple or a stock like Google. If Microsoft has a 40 cent range for the day, for example, you would still be able to read the cues, and it would be probably at a small delay, so uh, very good for uh, newer traders to, you know, start out trying to learn on that, in my humble opinion. Sure. Okay. Uh, we have another question regarding the actual Lightspeed charts, and the question is if you have this overlaying function um, on Lightspeed. And yes, on Lightspeed you can overlay several symbols on the same chart. Uh, you can compare stocks against one another, against ETFs, or against uh, indices. So we definitely do have that on there. And then we're getting some questions, Mark, about the title of your book, which is right here on the slide. It's Scalping for a Living, and where people can buy it. Uh, they could go to, I do a live trading broadcast uh, every trading day, five days a week at shinesroom.com. Um, names, and uh, I believe it's up on there. And potentially a few other websites that uh, I might not be aware of. Okay, let's see if there's any other questions coming in. Hey, uh, Dave Shine, if you're still on, do you have anything you want to add before uh, before we wrap it up? Uh, yeah, I'm still here. I mean, uh, for me, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Mark, you, you talk about a lot of your uh, technical prowess, which, uh, you know, I feel like you combine with a lot of these uh, sort of uh, side or, or, you know, additional parameters. So, like, as you're doing uh, correlations between ETFs and stocks uh, and you combine it with some of your uh, technical prowess, um, I was wondering if you could, you know, and I, I'd love to get it all the time from you. I, I was wondering if you could touch a little bit on 
uh, sort of how do you combine your technical with some of these uh, sort of secondary items and really for me uh, I've always been amazed on how consistent you are and sort of what makes you uh, combine all these things to form this consistency as a trader. I mean as we know um, consistency is the fundamentals of what we do, uh, at least for me. Uh, you know, I go back 15 years of consistent track record and, and you know, I'm always looking to, to enhance my skill set and, uh, you know, I look to guys like you to always, uh, I guess, be my guru and, and take me to promised land. So I ask, uh, how do you combine all these things? Talk a little bit about maybe some of your technical prowess if we have a few more minutes and uh, how do you combine that together with some of these other techniques you talked about? if you don't mind addressing that. Oh, absolutely not, Dave, and uh, I appreciate those kind words. But, you know, the whole thing is there's millions and millions of tools, things that I've never probably even heard of that you could apply to a chart. And, you know, some people, they like, all sorts of fancy things they like, you know, Fibonacci levels, which are great, Bollinger Bands, which are great, pivot points, which are great, and other types of technical analysis, uh, daily support and resistance levels, uh, five-minute support and resistance levels, channels, uh, wedges, bull flag patterns, you know. The whole thing as a trader is you really need to know what puts you in front. And for the first thing, I mean, uh, again, we have a rather large audience. I'm sure you have people from many different aspects right now. But when you're playing this market right now, and you, I mean, everybody has seen what this market could do. You have to put yourself in the best situation possible. I feel with Lightspeed that I'm driving, you know, a uh, Formula One car down the track, speeding with other people. And some of these people are, you know, especially my friends, and some of you are here, and you know I've told this to you over the phone, you know, some of you are still on other things, and it feels like you're driving a Toyota Camry while other people are driving a F1 race. So really, learn what works best for you, to answer your question, Shine. Learn what works best for you. Apply these things. For me, this is very simple. I can, I can overlap the cues. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, and it's a pet peeve. Uh, back in 99, I used to never use a chart. I would just read the level two boxes. But obviously, I've grown as a trader since then. For me personally, I do like uh, certain technical patterns that I look for because I keep a track record of how I do on some of these technical patterns. So I know myself as a trader, me personally, I do best on triangulation wedges, ascending channels, descending channels, bear flags, and bull flags. And uh, those tend to be the best type of chart patterns that I'm able to take advantage of. And as a result, I talk about all of those uh, things in my book, but it's really identifying what you do best and what you can use to be able to profit for yourself as every trader is unique, despite the fact that almost every trader uses some piece of the same technicals as others. And Mark, we might have to have you back to do another webinar for us just on those uh, technicals. Uh, I'd be honored. Okay, and then we have uh, someone that wants to know what do you find to be the best times of the day, of your trading day, uh, when you're most profitable on your trades? Is there one? Absolutely. And again, now you're talking about chapter two of my book where I talk about forming biases based on relativity and the times of day that you should be looking for the market. I do have times of day where I do the best uh, overall, 9.30 to 11 o'clock in the morning when the market is moving fast. Uh, that tends to be the best time I'm able to capitalize uh, depending on what type of news is out there. 11 to 2.30 usually slows off for me and uh, basically during that long period where the market just basically slows down. That's not always true, that's just usually true. And then, uh, so 11 to 2.30, so 2.30 I start reading the market, market again and at 3.30. So again, uh, my, the times of day that uh, I watch uh, specifically, and again, this is right off chapter two of my book, and what times do you look for this market relativity, is uh, 9.30 obviously in the morning, 10.15, 11 o'clock, 2.30, and 3.30 are the key times of day that uh, I'm uh, on full alert. Okay, let's see if uh, any other questions are streaming in. Mark, are you trading any options or just equities? 
mainly equity, but do dip my feet in the water sometimes with options. And um, again, these strategies can easily apply to options as well. Um, just depends on what type of uh, trader you are and what you like to take advantage of. And that's the real beauty about that question too, that you know, you do have the access to trade a lot of things and you know, for me, it's all about, I know a lot of you guys trade in big offices and, you know, that's great. You should always try to trade in, you know, some form of an office or whatever. And if you don't have that luxury, you do go into a radio broadcast site, anyone that you want. I would try, I would try them out. I, I personally believe Shine's Room is the, the best one. And you get to be part of a community that talks about not only trading equities, you have other people talking about everything from options and other different technical plays and other different markets as well. So keep in mind, um, you know, no matter what you trade, there's always a, a, a place where you can be able to hear all the things, or at least I know of one that I like. Okay, and have you seen personally any impact from high frequency traders, specifically not high frequency such as yourself, but automated trading programs and black boxes? Have you seen any impact on your trading strategies, whether it be positive or negative? Absolutely. I wouldn't classify it as positive or negative. I'm from, from a financial standpoint. Um, I could talk like any other trader and say the majority of my money was made back in 99 and 2000, just scalping in 500 shares in and out. Um, I was able to, uh, you know, pull seven figures for one year, six figures for a few others. But, you know, um, I, I haven't pulled seven figures this year, in all honesty, just for full disclosure. It's just not the type of trader I am. But I do aim for more consistency than for those numbers. So, um, good, wait, can you ask that question again? Sure. Sure. I'm just, sorry. sure. Just uh, obviously in the last couple of years, we've seen a huge influx in transaction volume from high frequency trading firms. Uh, automated algorithms, black boxes. So, you know, do you see a positive or a negative impact from that for your trading? Uh, we know they're adding a lot of volume, some volatility. Uh, you know, there's obviously argument on both sides, whether they're helpful or hurtful to both traders and investors. So kind of just wanted to get your thoughts on, on how, how they have impacted your trading. I've been doing fine ever since black boxes were out, but it is a very good question because my trading has changed, and that's sort of the beauty about uh, having your own book is that I constantly update my book. This is already uh, the second updated version of it, and as markets things change, such as uh, algorithmic trading and high frequency trading, obviously, um, you have to adjust to be in the right place and you need the right tools to do it. Again, that's why I think uh, light speed is so important. Uh, you know, uh, that's why I love it because in a market like this, you know, the how do you trade against these boxes without this platform? I'll never understand that. But you know, honestly, given 20 years ago, without the introduction of uh, black boxes and algorithmic trading, maybe there wasn't such a need for light speed back then as there is today. So for me, being able to get those quick routes and those quick fills is of utmost importance when I know that there's a box fighting me on the other side to get a fill. So it hasn't really changed uh, my consistency so much as it just basically changed the game. And I talk a little about that in my book as well. Okay. Yeah, that's a great answer. Uh, Mark, what's your regular profit target on each trade, whether it's percent-wise or dollars or cents? Um, it depends on the stock that I'm trading. I could trade a Delta Airlines, and if I catch uh, uh, 15 cents, <laughs> thanks, Dave. Um, you know, that was, that was David Shine from Shine's Room who actually gave me that play. But, you know, if I'm tr trading a stock like Delta Airlines, I'll be happy with 10, 15 cents any day, as long as I can risk 3 to 4, maybe even 5 cents to try to make that money. So it all comes to risk-reward. If I'm in an Apple trade and I'm, and I'm risking 30 cents, I'm probably looking to make 60 cents to $1.50 on the trade. So I just really want that risk-reward to be my, in my favor. There is no profit target. Depending on the type of uh, stock it is, I'll take more size or less size depending if it's a quick scalp or uh, or a stock that I'm planning on holding throughout the day okay so it's fair to say you're looking for two to three times the upside that you're willing to give up on the downside it's around two to 20 times but yeah that's basically the gist okay that's quite, that's quite a range uh, and that kind of leads me to the next question um, which is are you trading the same stocks on a daily basis or is it 
a whole new set of stocks every single day, or do you, you know, uh, what's your book look like? Well, I do trade multiple stocks throughout the day. However, there are a few favorites that I do tend to go to all the time. Apple, obviously, being uh, one of those stocks, um, you know, and. For me, there's so many stocks moving right now with so many different chart setups that I'm willing to dabble around the field. And I, I could trade as low as five stocks for a day, and I could trade as high as 50 stocks for a day, depending on the day that's obviously coming in. But more often than not, I tend to, if, if I'm the first place I'm looking for a potential trade tends to be Apple. Okay. All right, great. Well, listen, Mark, thank you for a phenomenal presentation. Really enjoyed it. Uh, of course, I want to thank our audience, as always, for joining us. We've had a phenomenal turnout today. So if anyone missed anything, please just visit our website. We'll have this presentation uploaded within the next day or two. It's going to be on lightspeed.com forward slash webinar. Uh, and you can catch all our previously archived webinars on there as well. So thank you again, everyone, and have a great night.